And what you hear a lot in Europe is we need China to cooperate with climate change as it's the largest emitter. Is there any evidence, whether it's competition with China over climate or cooperation of, with China, that we can actually influence Chinese, China's green policies? So in, at the margins, there is some evidence that actually European companies have considerable influence. So there's something uh, interesting that I'm looking to at the moment, that there are regions of China that are extremely keen uh, for further foreign investment, uh, particularly the, the, the so-called Chinese Rust Belt, uh, in the northeastern provinces, uh, sort of up towards the border with Korea and with Russia, um, they're already seeing kind of, you know, the kind of classic post-industrial decline. They get a lot of their energy from coal. Uh, they're kind of coal producing, steel producing, heavy industrial provinces. And they do have some very, very large European companies. So the largest Volkswagen plant, I think, in the world is in Shenyang, in Liaoning, in the northeast of China. Uh, you have a very big Michelin tire plant. Uh, in the same city, Shenyang. Uh, I am told uh, that those companies are, you know, among many, BMW, Mercedes, Michelin, all these companies that have made global promises uh, to have carbon neutral supply chains, uh, either right now or very soon. And they are saying to Chinese officials, we cannot expand our production if the only electricity that you can sell us is dirty electricity from coal. You are going to have to accelerate your energy transition if you want us to be able to stick around. And that gets them a hearing, not because they're the biggest employers in uh, the northeast of China, but because they're important and useful investors who bring the kind of advanced green technologies that China needs if it has any hope of making the ambitious targets set recently by Xi Jinping, the supreme leader, to make carbon as a uh, the ambitious targets set recently by Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader, to make China uh, net carbon neutral by 2060. That can't be done without advanced technologies that European companies are really, really good at. And so that does give uh, European companies some surprising leverage at the margins. There are some bigger political problems, I think, facing European and Western governments in general, which is that one of the things that makes carbon one of the things that makes climate change so hard politically is that governments mostly uh, believe that they have to tackle climate change, but they also know that the things they need to do to tackle climate change will be expensive and unpopular, at least in the short term. And so what they need to do is two things. They need to go to countries like China and say, you have to also take pain because we can't take pain if you don't because we can't let you compete with us by being dirty when we're trying to be clean. That is not politically sustainable. The other thing that Western governments do, and we've seen this very, very clearly from President Joe Biden as he tries to make the case to the American public that it's a good idea and will not be very painful to tackle climate change. Western politicians have a habit of saying there is a competition to dominate the green jobs of the future, to be the champions of green technology, and we, are going to beat China in that competition. We are going to roll out our clean green technologies and we are going to outcompete dirty Chinese technologies. And so as a result, maybe coal miners and oil workers will lose their jobs, but they'll get new high paying union jobs installing solar panels or building windmills. You know, you hear Joe Biden more or less saying that in explicit terms. But the problem is, that actually a lot of the fundamental technologies are not very advanced, things like wind turbines and solar panels, and China controls all of them. That China is just the dominant supplier of all of those things. So if you want China to really live up to its ambitious promises and to become green, and if you want to have you know, an affordable rollout of renewable energy, not just in China, but in the whole world, the jobs in many cases, are probably going to be in China. So that's a real trap, I think. There's a rhetorical trap that Western politicians have been setting for themselves, where they say, we are going to demand that China shows leadership and steps up and really tackles climate change in the same way that we are doing. And then in the next breath, they say, and it's not going to be as painful as you fear, because we are going to win the race to become a green technology champion in a kind of honourable competition with Chinese companies and lots of those green jobs are going to be right here at home. 
Well, I think there's a real danger that you can't have both. That actually, if you really want China to, to go green, and if you really want China to show global leadership in terms of taking the pain of uh, tackling climate change, you're also going to have to let China remain utterly dominant in some core green technologies. You can't have the jobs and, uh, and have China show leadership. And I think that is a kind of rhetorical trap that Western governments have kind of slightly got themselves into at the moment. And, you know, one way that populist European governments, uh, if they get elected, could get out of that is to turn to something that looks a lot like green protectionism. And I think there are versions of things like the, uh, the border adjustment tariff that we're seeing in Europe, looking at the carbon content uh, of goods crossing the border into Europe. At the moment, European Union leaders are very clear that this is not protectionism. It's designed to create a kind of virtuous cycle where you give countries like China an incentive to go green so that they never get hit by these tariffs. But, you know, you could imagine more populist, less responsible governments getting elected that start to think that uh, slapping on tariffs at the border in the name of green kind of purity is actually a smart way to keep Chinese uh, goods at bay. And if you do that, I'm not sure that you also get the whole world to go green. So in, an, in, an, in, in some ways, we've come full circle. You know, the very beginning of this conversation was about how uh, we have never tried to be this economically independent uh, with a country that poses such a challenge to our political norms and values. Well, there's an economic side to that too. We've never tried to rely on a country like China to help us solve global problems. Uh, we've never had a child. There has never been a time in human history where some of the biggest problems facing humanity, whether it's global warming or pandemics, are cross-border problems, and that there is a country like China that is indispensable to solving those problems. But if China is really going to solve those problems, you have to allow China to rise in ways that will be unbelievably disruptive to our own economies. And we've never tried to pull off that trade-off uh, in modern history. That's why China policy is so hard.